This video is sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the best way to carve out a space of your own online. Whether you're just starting out or managing an existing brand, Squarespace provides everything you need to create a beautiful website to engage with your audience, sell products, host content, and much more. With Squarespace, you don't need to be an expert at writing code. Simply select from dozens of pre-made flexible templates. Once you've found one to your liking, Squarespace's fluid engine allows you to customize your site as much or as little as you want. If you're looking to set up a merch store, Squarespace's partnerships with services like Shopify makes doing so easier than ever. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. When I was growing up, Star Trek and Star Wars were the titans of science fiction. These were the shows and movies which came to mind whenever I thought about the genre. But just as I have a lot of nostalgia for Trek and Wars, I also have a lot of nostalgia for a certain sci-fi action-adventure flick with a much different flavour. In his teens, French filmmaker Luc Besson was a huge fan of science fiction. But while others often cribbed from the likes of Asimov, Clarke and Bradbury, Besson enjoyed homegrown graphic novel works like Metal Hurlant, which later became heavy metal in the US, and Valerian and Loreline, among others. With these inspirations in mind, Besson began writing the screenplay for a sci-fi movie in his teens about a lowly construction worker named Zaltam Bleros, who wins a trip to the resort planet Floston Paradise, where he then falls in love with a 2,000-year-old alien woman called Lilo. Over time, the story shifted and changed, eventually coalescing into the rough outline of what would later become the fifth element. However, the initial script was over 400 pages long. Despite its huge length and large required budget, the project attracted interest from Gamond Film Company in the early 90s. While Besson developed the script further, at one point considering turning his massive script into a trilogy of movies, he also hired legendary French comic book artists Jean Girard, aka Mobius, and Jean-Claude Meziers to create the look of the film. As the artists continued to work on the look of the film, Besson retooled the story according to their artwork. It was thanks to Messier's drawing of a New York taxicab that Zaltam Bleros, later changed to Corbin Dallas, became a taxi driver as opposed to a construction worker. Unfortunately at the time, no studio was willing to finance the film's huge $100 million budget, and so the project stalled. However, after the critical and commercial success of Besson's film Leon the Professional, Besson tried shopping the fifth element around again, albeit on a reduced budget of $90 million. This more refined version did attract interest from Sony under their Columbia Pictures label, and Besson worked with writer Robert Mark Kamen to bring the script down to a tighter 120 pages. For the lead role, Besson initially had two names in mind, Mel Gibson and Bruce Willis. While the former declined the offer, Willis showed interest in the film before development stalled. After remounting the project with a reduced budget, Besson assumed he'd be unable to afford Willis. Willis, however, asked to read the script anyway, and a few hours later told Besson he'd be happy to reduce his salary in exchange for a cut of the box office. By the following day, Bruce Willis was cast as the protagonist Corbin Dallas. For the crucial role of Lilu, Besson wanted a more unknown actress, allegedly auditioning over 300 hopefuls. An initial frontrunner was Elizabeth Berkley, but eventually Ukrainian-American actress Mila Jovovich won the part. Her original audition was actually received quite poorly, as Jovovich was clearly nervous, but later that day, Besson had a chance encounter with Jovovich at a hotel, where she convinced the director to give her a second audition. This audition was much more successful, and Jovovich joined the cast as Lilu. To play the villainous Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg, Besson approached Gary Oldman. The actor and director had become friends while working together on Leon the Professional, and Oldman won the role of Zorg without an audition. Years later, Oldman would reveal he didn't especially like the script for The Fifth Element or the finished film. He took on the role as a favour to Besson, who was producing Oldman's film Nil by Mouth. To play the celebrity DJ Ruby Rod, Besson first approached rock and pop superstar Prince. Prince, however, turned the offer down due to scheduling conflicts. 
Besson's next two choices were Chris Tucker or Jamie Foxx. While Besson did like Fox, Tucker's slender build made him a better fit for the character's gender-fluid appearance. Rounding out the main cast was the late, great Ian Holm as the priest Vito Cornelius. Other notable members of the cast included actor and part-time professional wrestler the late Tommy Lister Jr. as President Lindenberg, another sci-fi veteran Brian James as General Monroe, and the late Luke Perry as Billy. British comedy fans will also notice comedian Lee Evans as Fogg, as well as Mac McDonald of Red Dwarf fame as a New York police officer. At the time, The Fifth Element was the most expensive French film ever made, though it was filmed mostly in England at Pinewood Studios. This was with the exception of the opening in Egypt which was filmed in Mauritania, and some of the Flossed in Paradise scenes which were shot at the Royal Opera House in London. For the various New York scenes, a full-scale taxicab was built on a huge gimbal rig. This meant there was no need for the actors to fake being thrown around by the G-forces in the chase sequence. While Bruce Willis was comfortably secured in his seat, Mila Jovovich was free to move around, which for some shots was quite dangerous. This was typical of Jovovich throughout production, as she embraced performing as many of her own stunts as possible, even if this often left her quite bruised. She also performed most of her fight scene with the Mangalores, with the exception of the backflips and handsprings, which were performed by a trained gymnast. Jovovich also had to learn the divine language, which was invented by Luc Besson, though it was mostly gibberish as opposed to a functioning, constructed language like Klingon. In order to get comfortable with the language, Mila Jovovich regularly conversed with Besson in the language. The costumes for the movie were created by famed designer Jean-Paul Gaultier. The costumes, like the general look of the film, were designed to be colourful and sleek as opposed to the gritty, lived-in future aesthetic which was so popular with sci-fi movies at the time. The visual effects were supervised by Mark Stetson, known for his acclaimed work on Total Recall, who worked in tandem with Digital Domain. Despite significant advances in digital effects at the time, miniatures and matte paintings were used extensively throughout in combination with CGI. All of the spaceships seen in the movie were created as miniatures, as well as Corbin's New York taxicab and several police vehicles. Much of New York itself was built in several large-scale miniatures. The dense traffic was created digitally using complex simulations, similar to the techniques used for the aerial battles in Independence Day. The music was composed by longtime Besson collaborator Eric Serra. Serra used an eclectic mix of orchestra, electronica, and world music for the film. One of the most complex pieces was of the opera performance. While the diva character was played by actress Maywen Labesco, the actual singing was performed by Inva Mula. In the movie, she's supposed to be an alien, so she's able to do things that a human couldn't do. So I had to compose things that, that were impossible to sing. So when I gave her the, <laughs> the score, she looked at it and said, well, it's impossible. I said, yeah, I know, <laughs> it's impossible, but we have samplers and all these machines that we can do what we want. There were some phrases I thought were impossible, and she could do it. She was amazing. After decades of development and three years of production, The Fifth Element premiered at the Cannes Film Festival before its wide release on the 7th of May 1997. Like the best exemplars of the sci-fi genre, The Fifth Element is a film which utterly transports its audience to another world. This film is a visual and audio feast with a thoroughly unique style, tone and atmosphere. I've always loved the visual effects of this era of filmmaking. The combination of large-scale miniatures and CGI holds up very well, but what sets The Fifth Element apart is its vibrancy. One would think leaning in the opposite direction from the gritty, lived-in future of Star Wars and Blade Runner and so on would make The Fifth Element seem cheap and artificial. However, The Fifth Element still feels grounded and tactile while also being vibrant and garish. It really nails that comic book look which made Mobius and Messier's work so stunning. The art direction may have helped cement the fifth element's look and style, but it's Eric Serra's outstanding score which creates the film's unique tone and atmosphere. Many orchestral elements are present, but the tracks are more string-heavy than brass, with percussion mostly being driven by electronica, and texture being provided by ethnic vocals. 
Love it or hate it, the fifth element should be commended for running in a totally different direction to many mainstream sci-fi movies of the day. Rather than drawing on the familiar pools of Asimov, Clark, Bradbury, Gibson and K. Dick as Star Trek, Star Wars, Blade Runner and Alien did, the fifth element's mix of Jodorowsky and heavy metal, as seen through the lens of Luc Besson, still feels fresh to this day. The diva dance sequence is the perfect example of the film's bold creative choices, resulting in something utterly brilliant. The song itself is an absolute banger. The design of the diva herself feels ripped right out of a Valerian comic book. The fight choreography is equal parts Jackie Chan and Three Stooges. Conventional wisdom tells us these things put together should not work, but it absolutely does. All that being said, despite the stylistic weirdness, The Fifth Element is, at its core, quite a traditional Hollywood action blockbuster. The decision to cast Bruce Willis is an inspired one. Having shot to superstardom as John McClane, he's the perfect everyman hero for the audience to relate to in this mad adventure. Hell, the film even pulls its own diehard scenario in the second act. But while Willis brings his A-game, it's Jovovich who steals the show as Lilu. To be perfectly honest, the character she's given to play is pretty thin. Despite the entire story literally revolving around her character, Lilu is quite passive for huge portions of the film, being led around by either Corbin or Cornelius. In spite of that shortcoming, however, Jovovich's talents shine through. She weaves an innate vulnerability and childlike curiosity into her performance, which makes Lilu both sympathetic and charming. Pairing her with the cynical, salt-of-the-earth Corbin Dallas makes for the perfect odd couple, elevated significantly by Willis and Jovovich's great chemistry. Lilu Dallas multipass. Yeah. Multipass. Lilu, uh, multipass, you know this multipass. Lilu Dallas, my wife. You know how it is, bump into each other, sparks multipass. happen. Yeah, she knows it's a multipass. Yeah, anyway, we're in love. But it's the physical side of things which she handles exceptionally well, taking on the various chases and fight scenes with a commitment and confidence she would later utilize as Alice in the Resident Evil movies. In general, all of the cast are on top form. I've always felt as though Ian Holm is the unsung treasure of the movie as Cornelius. Unlike Corbin, who has his military experience to fall back on, Cornelius bumbles around aimlessly, clearly way in over his head on the mission to save the universe. And Holm lends the character the perfect combination of gravitas and humour. Meanwhile, Gary Oldman hams it up wonderfully as Zorg. A lesser actor would be overshadowed by such a ridiculous costume, but Oldman still manages to come across as skin-crawlingly dangerous. When it comes to Chris Tucker's Ruby Rod, however, I can understand some viewers who find him extremely annoying as the comic relief sidekick to the badass action hero. I suppose it comes down to personal taste, but I really like the character. The Prince-inspired combination of campness and sexuality is another interesting choice for this kind of character, and Tucker is at the height of his comedic powers when delivering a flurry of great lines. His lovely daughter I love to sing! She recently confessed to me. By the way, I have a recording of her talented voice. <sighs> Even though the film has a generally brisk pace, it's also quite cluttered plot-wise. The amount of characters and factions, their various motivations, the shifting alliances, the hunt for MacGuffin, it's all a lot to keep track of. However, it seems the movie is aware of this to a certain extent, and actually minds this for some comedy. It seems like every time Corbin answers his phone, checks his mail, or answers the door, trouble follows soon after. The larger cosmic conflict of the movie between good and evil is esoteric but effective. Even though very little of this conflict is defined in detail, it works on a sensational level. The big ball of evil named Mr. Shadow is a pretty scary villain at times. The opening space battle and phone call with Zorg enter some suitably Lovecraftian territory. The idea that merely hearing Shadow's voice or staring at it too long will cause a person to go insane or physically bleed from the head is very unsettling. It's a conflict built more on thematic ideas rather than detailed mythology, which facilitates the conclusion playing out as it does. Even though Lilu being shocked at humanity's history of warfare and her severely weakened state inside the temple feels contrived, the ending still comes to a moving climax. Corbin and Lilu are both lost people. Corbin feeling aimless and dejected as a lowly cab driver, and Lilu feeling overwhelmed by this new world and her quest. Even though Corbin's character is given a lot more focus and agency, the love story between he and Lilu still works. 
Corbin fighting to overcome his cynicism and depression, and Lilu desperate for someone to see her as a person and give her a reason to go on, rather than simply fulfilling the purpose she was made for. I need you. I need you very much. Why? Because I, I love you. <gasps> The fifth element isn't some piece of transgressive deconstructionist filmmaking, but it's still heaps of fun, action-packed, and brimming with eye candy, not to mention gloriously cheesy and sentimental. This is a story of good versus evil where love literally conquers all, and I honestly love that about the movie. In weaker hands, the fifth element could have been a saccharine mess, but instead it's a vibrant romp, reveling in an avant-garde style which is just as sickly as it is dazzling. Upon release, The Fifth Element was met with quite mixed reviews from critics. Some commended its ambition and style, while others named it as one of the worst sci-fi movies of the year. In the years following its release, the film has achieved cult status in some circles, while winding up on so bad it's good lists in others. Audiences at the time seemed to be more positive, however, which was certainly reflected at the box office. The film grossed $263 million against a $90 million budget, making it the highest grossing French film ever at the time. It remains popular on home video to this day, recently being remastered in 4K. Also in recent years, Luc Besson returned to the sci-fi genre with an adaptation of Valerian and Loreline in Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. In many ways, Valerian was an attempt at replicating the success of The Fifth Element, which was heavily inspired by the Valerian series in the first place. While it's even more vibrant and spectacular as The Fifth Element thanks to huge advances in visual effect technology, the narrative isn't as strong. In some scenes, there is more visual imagination in single shots than contemporary blockbusters have in their entire runtime. Unfortunately, the film is let down by the leads who feel fatally miscast. Unlike Willis and Jovovich in The Fifth Element, Dane DeHaan and Cara Delevingne, despite their respective talents, don't have the charisma to guide the audience through the film's episodic plot. That being said, the film does such a great job at translating this delightfully pulpy sci-fi universe to the screen that it did get me to read the books, which are fantastic. While it may not have replicated the success of The Fifth Element at the box office or as a film, like The Fifth Element, Valerian the City of a Thousand Planets opened my eyes to sci-fi territory I hadn't ventured into before, and I think that's why The Fifth Element endures. At its heart, it may be quite a traditional Hollywood blockbuster, but it feels fresh and exciting. It comes at the sci-fi genre from a totally different angle, combining sights and sounds, images and music, in a way no other creative team thought of doing up until that point. And in spite of all of its flaws, that makes The Fifth Element something truly special. That's the best show I ever did. <sighs> Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe and share to stay up to date on all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, jump over to my Patreon where you can see videos early, uncut, and ad-free. Speaking of which, I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons and members now appearing on screen, with an ultra thanks to Stacked, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Will Martin, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Kajing G. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.